carry uh, blue or mesh box, which I tell people that's like a two-story outhouse. <laughs> Ubers aren't going to use that. So, and then just more that you know aren't taken care of. You know, if your box starts to lose the bottom or the top looks like that, I'm sure a bluebird might use that, but um, you know, how safe is that gonna be for the, the bluebird? And uh, of course, you're all members and stuff, so I, you know, when I do this program, I like to plug the, you know, supporting bra. But um, anybody can make donations. Uh, like I said, if you don't have house grill problems after that fishing trick, <clears throat> donations would be great. Oh. And that's the end of my, <laughs> my program. I probably covered everything so well, there's not even a question out there, but is anybody, we're going to do the Q&A uh, following me, so we're going to get some other experts up here, but I'm, uh, as far as my program goes, you got a question there? I've just always been amazed that um, bluebirds take the poop sack from the babies and remove it. Um, do other birds do that? Yes. The grackles will take the poop sacks from my neighborhood and drop them in every bird bath I have. <laughs> they are terrible at that, but you're right, the, uh, the bluebirds are clean. Uh, robins do the same thing. Um, you'll notice that tree swallows, as they get older, the parents either don't do poop sacks or it just gets overbearing because the size of, the, of a tree swallow box are always full of uh, excrement. Um, that's what's nice about bluebirds, when they get done with a nest box, you can remove that nest, and there really isn't much cleaning to do in that box. She was wondering about uh, the fecal sack removal. People don't do bluebirds do that. They clean the nest out when they go to feed them. So that was the answer to that question. You got another one? Yeah. What's your <clears throat> favorite treatment for ants? Oh, um, you know, that's interesting. Uh, I used to, to use diatomaceous earth which you take a tablespoon or so, you get that at the garden center, it's a granule type thing. You lift the nest up and you put it underneath there. But um, since then, uh, when I've done this talk, I've had some, uh, some uh, people that have tried things out in the country more, and a couple of bay leaves underneath the nest. When you're cooking, get a couple of bay leaves, and that, they don't like bay leaves. And the other one is like a teaspoon of cinnamon. Oh, yeah. Ants don't like cinnamon. Um, those are probably the, the three best that I know of. Um, we don't want you spraying the box with anything. Um, and I, I don't know why, but I don't get a lot of ants, but they're called ground ants. And um, I did have a, uh, um, a wren nest this year that after they had fledged and I went to check it, the, the whole bottom of the stick thing was just full of a whole ant nest. Um, but it was after after the rents had finished using the nest, so. But um, I tried the bay leaf thing, and I think that worked, and I, I think one time I did cinnamon, and that worked. But um, diatomaceous earth, I had to buy a big bag of it, I still got it, so. Um, yeah? On your graph there, you showed the bluebird fledging up to maybe 35,000 back down to 10, but you also showed the tree swallows, which seemed to be the same. Was there any explanation for that? Yeah. Um, part of part of that is because, like I said, we're not a tree swallow society, so a lot of our members don't really follow or try to to document that as as dedicated as they do bluebirds. I think so. We don't get an accurate number back from people, um, probably, and um, we just want to make sure that it isn't dropping dramatically. And you know, when I started doing this, tree swallows didn't return until about the mid the late part of April. And um, then they started coming before mid-April. And Ken Tall and I were talking about, where do you think those bluebirds are coming from that they don't go down to South America anymore? And then I started going to Arizona and Florida in the winter, and I found that's where a lot of tree swallows are during the winter, so they're, they're lazy. They aren't going across the Gulf of Mexico anymore. So they are, actually, you can start getting tree swallows in March already, and then they start competing for the box. The thing is, they do, usually they aren't ready to nest and lay eggs until there's a good insect flying population, which needs warmer weather than when they return. 
So you don't have to worry about them really nesting right away, but I have found feathers in a box in early April where they start claiming the box, you know. I've had bluebirds just come and remove them and put their nest in there, which, you know, that's good to see. But, um, yeah, I've got, I've got my share of tree soil, but not everybody reports them as diligently, I guess, is probably why that line doesn't really go up like the other ones do. If we reversed it, you know, that would be the case. I did read one time, uh, about a year ago, out east there is a group that does favor tree swallows, and in this uh, little article they, they said, we aren't happy with the bluebird people that remove the nest of tree swallows. And so I don't know if some other states kind of don't frown on it as much as we do, but we don't like to have native birds removed to, um, to try and get bluebirds, you know. Any other questions? Uh, right there. Where do you put the string on the tube feeder, the fish line? Okay, if it's, a, if it's a plastic tube feeder that has perches or the hole that the birds sit at and eat, I tie, tie a little piece of it to one or two of the perches. Okay. Um, you know, I, I don't do it on every perch. If I have a rain guard above it, you know, a plastic thing, sometimes you can just tape a little piece down and three sides are, you know, just hanging down. And as long as there's some kind of fishing line nearby that feeder, you'll, you'll kind of find that the house sparrows will fly to it. I, I do know that recently fledged house sparrows, the babies, do come to it for about a day or so, but you'll actually see the adults flying at them and going like this past them to say, get out of there. And I don't know what it is. I mean. Somebody said maybe the way the light transfers through it or something, but um, I, I really don't, I can't explain it. Yeah? How close to your home can you put a bluebird house? I mean, I've got a pond and a very open area, but I just now had a block at this home that I'm at. So I'm taking my houses down and I'm going to reposition them. I do get the tree swallows, and I've had wrens, but having trouble attracting bluebirds, so. Okay, she's asking where to put a bluebird box in relationship to the house. I know some people out in the country have them real close to the house, right off their deck or right by a window that they can look five or ten feet out and see the, the bluebird's activity. Um, I, I have one box that I monitor down by uh, south of Mount Horeb, and uh, she's an elderly lady that loves bluebirds, and she used to have them off of the deck of her bedroom, and then that got kind of uh, overgrown and Ren started using that box. So I took one of the other boxes she had and I put it right out in front of her bay window. And she has a feeding station about 10 feet away, which I wasn't really happy about because I wasn't sure how that would matter with the bluebirds, but they come and nest in that box right out her front door, right in front of her bay window. And she loves the fact she can just look right out there and see them. And then when the, when the birds come to the feeder, that male bluebird does give them heck. It, doesn't succeed all the time, but I have seen it chasing uh, like downy woodpeckers away and things like that. But um, so that's real, that was only like 10 feet off the front of her porch. So um, as far as the uh, habitat goes, they do like some short grass areas that they can find food in, and I would imagine you probably have that. Um, the pond is probably going to be something that brings in some tree swallows, though, right? Uh, yes, the tree swallows like that in the Martins and, and all of that. Um, yeah. So I'm wondering if that's where they're having trouble. I, hmm. I'm going to just try to reposition my houses this year and see if that helps me out. Yeah. You know, sometimes I move the box as little as 10 feet and it went from not producing bluebirds to getting bluebirds right away. And I don't know what was the difference because it really didn't matter. The habitat was pretty much the same around it. Yeah, back there somebody had a question, I think. Further back, yeah? Yeah, the, the fishing line? Um, I try to put it on the feeder if I can. I do have a, a large tray feeder that has a roof over it that's plexiglass. Wild Birds Unlimited has this huge uh, tray feeder that um, has two different screens that pop out. 
And if you put seed in there, um, I had the fishing line tied to those trays so that when the, bird, the house sparrows wanted to come in there, they might see the fishing line. But I noticed that the birds scratch around enough that the fishing line gets covered. So then I put it right on the edges of the roof. It just two, of, two on each side, just a little five inch piece of fishing line hanging down. And it's not enough to get tangled in. And the house sparrows don't go to that feeder at all. No matter what kind of seed is in there. Um, I was surprised when I had a, I put out a, a cylinder feeder that's meant for peanut heads. And uh, you know those like, kind of like hardware cloth things that have quarter inch squares and you just fill them up. And uh, you know I've been in my place for seven years and for five years I never had a house barrel on the peanuts before. And then last winter I looked out and there's like six house barrels that are just eating all the peanuts out of there. And I thought, oh, and I get the fishing line out. And all I put was one piece about five inches long. I tied it to one of the um, mesh things at about halfway point. Never had a house bear on it after that. The woodpeckers, chickadees, the nuthatches come in and take the seed. I do have a problem with starlings though. They come in sometimes. Not real bad, but um, they will, they do like those peanuts. And I, I do have to deal with them once in a while. Yeah? You didn't mention ventilation holes, permit, permit them. Is that the right way to process that? For, for the nest boxes? Yeah, for the nest boxes. Yeah, yeah. And um, or black fly, and or uh, you know, don't you don't have any of those shovels? Um, I didn't get that last comment, but he's asking about ventilating boxes and black flies and things like that. Yeah. And yeah, you do want to have a ventilated box. Um, you do want some airflow. It doesn't take much. You know, the entrance hole is, is a vent itself, but then on the side, one or two holes on the side are helpful. Um, and then that does open up the possibility of black flies. It also opens up the possibility that in April or May, when it's cold, that sometimes a vent hole can actually chill a box. So some people will block it, make it so they can block the vent holes when it's colder weather. Um, but somehow venting after Memorial Day especially should be done. And then as far as black flies go, they haven't been a problem too much the last two years, I don't think. But if you get warm, humid weather suddenly in the end of May, those things do hatch out of the streams for some reason. It used to be more so in the southwest or the western part of the state, but now it's kind of moved across. Um, but we kind of find permethrin is the, the best way to deal with those. Uh, the spray that you use for anti-tick spray on your clothing, yeah. you don't want to put it on your skin. But um, we find that spraying the outside of the box, wherever there's openings, um, that, that lasts a good two to three weeks. And so permethrin is probably the, the best preventative for, for black flies. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any ideas about that. Do we have any other bluebird experts here that want to do any Q&A, any, any A for the Qs? Um, I don't have to be the only one, but... You could be the only one. Okay. Did, That's fine. Did you ever... If I don't know the answer, I just make it up. But. Did you ever use that sticky stuff uh, on... Oh, that... Uh, There's a can of sticky whatever to paste onto your... You didn't mention any of that. Um, I, I don't recommend the sticky stuff just because um, you'll get stuck to it eventually. But you'll find that a lot of uh, gnats and bugs and other critters get stuck on it. I don't really think it keeps the black flies from going up to the nest box. Um, if, I know they used to say grease the pole to keep the raccoons out. And I tried that and I ended up getting grease all over myself and then after about two weeks in the sun it cakes and and it's just a real mess. I never really found that effective either. Um, not as good as the uh, normal guard worked for me and it was less messy to deal with. But um, I forget what that sticky stuff uh, is called. Um, Tanglefoot. Tanglefoot. Yeah, that's, that's one of those can be dangerous to a lot of other, other stuff. You know, they can get caught in that and die um, slow death, you know, if, not, if you don't find it there. Um, 
But yeah, I, I would prefer the permethrin. You can get that at sporting goods stores, camping stores. I think even found at Menards now. Uh, of course, online always has that stuff, but. It's a fly um, spray, so fleet farm carries it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's meant to keep flies and stuff and poultry. Uh, yeah, anything like that, yeah. It just, it doesn't, they don't recommend, it's not like off or something you put on your skin. But um, a lot of people that walk out in the grasses, if you have long pants, you spray it on your pants. Um, you can you can have that treat your pants and it, it lasts, uh, I think they said 20 washings before it wears off. And then you don't have to worry about ticks climbing up. They, they die when they hit that stuff. So it's pretty effective for clothing if you're of birding or, or monitoring and you're going through some tall grasses that might have ticks in. And, and one last, for me, for me anyway, the, uh, the guard, predator guard. Yeah. <coughs> We've got these elaborate wire deals sticking out five inches. Uh, the little three quarter inch uh, predator guard that you could make and put on there. Um, that would make your hole maybe an inch and a half or so. Yeah. The critters can't hardly bend in to, to, to get down at your birds or the, the babies. Uh, true, true, if the, true if the box is deep enough and the nest is low enough. If you have a typical bluebird box that's not real deep and if the hen builds that nest kind of high, a coon could reach in there and grab stuff. So I don't recommend a block alone as being put on there as being a coon guard. Um, originally that was for the Hill Lake box that went real deep and the Baldry box was the same way. The box with the hole in the top, inner top in the Green Bay area. Um, I know there's a couple guys that still use the Baldry box and when the hen builds the nest real tall, when the eggs are laid, then they remove four or five inches of the nest and drop it back down just so the coons can't get in and grab that. Yeah, well, I, I, I guess I lied. I got one more question. Okay, um, okay. In looking around here, and at the bluebird houses that are made and offered for sale and whatever, they seem all bigger than what we've been traditionally building here for the last few years. Anyway, me, uh, I don't have anything. I'm not building anything that big. For bluebirds, it just seems like a big area for the bluebird to fill up with a nest. Yeah, they might be building boxes to cover the whole United States, and the mountain bluebird does use a larger base box. Yeah. And that way they can call it a bluebird box. It's not that an eastern bluebird won't use a larger floor right. box. <coughs> that, that size box over there is more in keeping with what I Yeah. What I yeah. Well, um, Florence Laney came up with a lot of designs and he, he really prefers the Nat box or the Nat style box that we usually promote um, that has the correct size bottom and Ubers are happy with that. But, you know, when I took over the trail at Kiganza, a lot of the boxes had like three by three bottoms and they were deep. And uh, I found tree swallows love those. It's just, they can drop down at the small, even though they have seven chicks and at a time in those little boxes. But I also found that in the spring when they came back, if there wasn't scratches on the inside, I found dead ones in there because they couldn't climb out. So I got rid of all the deep boxes and um, put in regular bluebird boxes right away. But again, this is going back to the 90s and everybody was trying to create the best bluebird box and scouts were making them, like I said, and people were donating them to the state park and they didn't want to do with them. And um, so there was a lot of um, boxes I didn't like there. There was a tree branch box too that just had the hornets. And um, I, I was never a big fan of the tree box either. Uh, tree branch one. Right. Yeah, uh, Zern, Zern came up with that one, I think. Um, I don't know, has anybody ever had a tree branch and had success with it? That's a long, narrow box. The bluebirds go in and they're supposed to nest way at the other end and then Nothing can reach into them. Sometimes they didn't use it a lot. So it was 
Yeah. Um, just for, for you that don't know what that is, it's it's a long bar, and the idea is the bluebird goes in the entrance, and then way toward the back there's a little half wall, and then just a little spot at the very end where some vent holes are on the back side, and the bluebird's supposed to nest behind that half wall, and that's the theory. But what I found is that bluebirds don't like to do that much work to go back there, and they built the nest right by the entrance hole, and then more often than not, tree swallows like them again, and they would just build a nest anywhere in that first part. But once the blue, any bird nests toward the front of the hole, it's vulnerable to something reaching in. But uh, Frank Zern, I think, is, came up with that. He was down in Tennessee and saw bluebirds nesting in a cannon when he was waiting for his wife who was shopping. Well, you guys know what that's like. Um, anyway, he's got this theory that they go into this cannon and nest deep inside. They're protected. So he kind of came up with this tree branch uh, idea. But, um, I don't know if anybody had tried it and it works. It's fine, but I had never found it to be a very good box. Yeah, yeah. It's like the boundary box with the hole in the roof with the screen on it, the rain comes in. The house girls won't like it. When I tried that, the house girls just put more brass at the top. <laughs> and they just nested in it anyway. Yeah, back there, I got a question. Is anybody working uh, with banding bluebirds? Doing any tracking with banding? Uh, I, I think Ann Wickfield does it down in the blue Mo or Black Earth area. Um, yeah, Ann Wick, I think, still was banding. She's got 250 boxes or so. I believe she still bans them. Um, Mosquito Hill, too. I know Adam, the ranger out there. I forget Adam's last name, but... Brant. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you remember Marie's last name, the woman that used to come and talk about um, bird banding and bird migration at Wild Bird? Uh, there was a woman at the University of Madison that uh, banded songbirds. And um, this, I can't remember. Uh, I, McDonald. Yeah, Marie McDonald. Anyway, she passed away a few years back. But she came to Wild Birds to do a talk for a Saturday morning program. And um, I was helping her get her computer set up and everything. And I knew she banned it at Lake, or the Lakeshore area of the university in the Arboretum there. And um, we had some customers that had come in the previous winter, and they, they lived up by Lodi, which is just north of Middleton. And they said they had these bluebirds coming to their bird feeders and their heated bird bath that had orange and... Uh, I think yellow bands on their, their legs. And they wondered how they got banded. Well, I sent Ann Wick a message and she said, no, I never use color bands. I only put a metal band on mine. I don't have the permit to do color or something like that. So when Marie was there setting up, I said, you know, you've banded a lot of birds. Have you ever banded bluebirds? And she said, yeah, I did it in 2009 at Polk Farm, just down the road from where, blue, where wild birds is. And I said, oh, really?